Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and James Holland. Um, James, who are we talking to today? Uh, well, we've got a really interesting guest today. We're talking to Dr. Yeah. Caroline Shenton, who used to be the Director of the Parliamentary Archives at Westminster. I mean, what a job. What and, a gig. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we've got to have at least a, a couple of minutes on that. Um, but but she's also written a book last year called National Treasures, Saving the Nation's Art in World War II. Um, but it's not just sort of um, uh, evacuating the National Gallery and the National Portrait Gallery, etc. It's actual treasures. It's actually dismantling the ceiling of the Banqueting Hall and the Sutton Hoo treasures and the Doomsday yeah. Book and things like this. Um, and what happened to them and basically sort of getting them out of London. Uh, and it's one of those things that we kind of sort of vaguely think about, I think, and vaguely know about, but don't know in any detail yeah. whatsoever. So, Caroline, we're thrilled to have you on and um, you can tell us all about it. Yeah, really delighted to be here. Thanks for having uh, me well, on. Welcome. Um, now, um, so uh, uh, the Parliamentary Archive, is that l- lots and lots of copies of Hansard? <laughs> uh, there's well, more to it than that, obviously. That's right. It's all, it's all the records of Parliament going back to 1497. I say all of the records of Parliament. There, there is a bit of a gap because uh, a lot of the House of House of Commons records, yes, exactly, got burned uh, to a cinder in 1834. But some of the great constitutional treasures were actually part of the Lord's collection, so they survived the fire. So things like Charles I's death warrant and the Great Reform Act and the Bill of Rights. So it's it's pretty great archive and currently stored inside the Houses of Parliament. And are you someone who, you know, if you're looking at a, a document like like you know, the, the Charles Charles First death warrant, do you find you're completely directly in touch with the history via it? Is it are you? Did you find that those sort of artifacts connect you directly, or do they feel like precious objects? Do, do, do you know what I mean? There's a because because they are precious, or, or are they both, more than that? Yeah, they're both. Yeah. They're both because as soon as you see something like that. You start to think, who else has touched this? Who else has viewed yeah. this? Does it still have a little bit of Cromwell's DNA on it? That sort of thing. So mm. it, it's we're both, not, really. We're not going to clone Cromwell in a Jurassic Park style, though, from that document. Let's not do that, no. I <laughs> don't think that would be a good move. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, your your book, I mean, uh, 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 as Jim says, I, you know, because my, my familiarity is is with this idea is my, my grandparents used to live in Bath and you'd have to go through the Box Hill Tunnel. And my dad would always say, oh, this is where they stored stuff during the during the war. There was stuff stored in the Box Hill Tunnel because it's a very deep tunnel and that's where they kept the art. And that, but that that's pretty much as much as as much as I know about about this. So um, when when did this process get get? in motion in the Second World War? Because obviously they'd been bombing in the first. So this was a thing that people had been thinking about as a result of the previous war. Yeah, this is this is the bombers always getting through, isn't it? So everyone... Yeah. Because ev- cause it starts right at the beginning of the war, doesn't it, Caroline? And, and you know, I was sort of thinking, well, why is that? Well, the, the reason is because everyone thinks there's going to be kind of mass Armageddon and bombers coming over. Well, what's really amazing, I think, is that actually the planning for this began in 1933, the same week that Hitler came to power. There was a top secret cabinet subcommittee called together to look at what would happen if London were bombed and what the air raid precautions should be for art treasures, which just seems extraordinarily prescient, doesn't it? Mm. And a sign of just how seriously people were taking the threat. And as you say, this this idea that the bomber will always get through was something that preyed on the minds of politicians and indeed curators throughout the 1930s and some of these curators themselves had served in the first world war so yeah. they were absolutely convinced that as soon as war was declared there was going to be an immediate strike on london combined with poison gas from the air yeah and uh, this cabinet subcommittee which was made up of the directors of the national museums and galleries and a few advisors put together by 1934 a little green booklet pretty modest but setting out what precautions should be taken by museums and galleries actually across the country to protect their treasures. So, you know, build a reinforced basement in your museum if you can do, start to set up first aid posts, think about where you might want to evacuate things if you need to get them out of the building. 
uh, and was there any money uh, on offer for this? Because you know, build a build a reinforced basement. Well, yeah, we'd love to. You know, because because this this sounds like one of those sort of. Um, you know, you, these committees where they offer good advice, but unless there's money, it's, it's all a bit pointless, right? Well, this is where it ran into trouble, really, because <laughs> <laughs> the Treasury wasn't really prepared to stump up the cash. Um, yeah. And so really it was it was left for the provincial museums. It was left left to them to sort of, you know, approach their trustees and decide yeah. what to do. And often they were very modest arrangements made. But for the big national museums, this did really become an issue by the late... 1930s when things were really starting to hot up and there were you know very serious you know concerns expressed that the treasury was not going to fund all of this activity yeah um and perhaps the most the most striking example of that is the national library of wales in aberystwyth which uh, had offered the british museum library i.e today the british library yeah a home uh, should this happen ended up having to fund its own ARP cave as it called it tunneled out of the hillside underneath the library building opposite Cardigan Bay it just went ahead and did it anyway the trustees decided to stump up the money because the treasury was was dragging its feet so much right about providing something uh, so it, I mean in the end you know, money money was forthcoming, not as much as perhaps should have been, but given the scale of the expenditure on everything else to yeah. do with the war, this really was a drop in the ocean. Gosh, I mean, Aberystwyth's surely far enough away that you maybe don't need to build a tunnel from, from any possible bombing. It's interesting that even in even somewhere as far away as that, there's the feeling that you need to build a secure and hard site. Uh, uh, I mean, it just it just shows that the, the sort of fear of the power of the bomber, the idea that. The Luftwaffe is going to have yeah, Aberystwyth on its, on its list. It's quite yeah, interesting. Yes, and the, 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 the National Librarian of Wales, a guy called William Llewellyn Davis, who was actually one of the heroes of my book, and he's, he's, a, he's a great visionary and a really dynamic force. He doesn't look like that, though. I mean, if you look at a photograph of him, I describe him as you know possibly looking like a cinema projectionist or a sort of you know, a meek bank <laughs> clerk. That is what he looks like. But, you know, he's got the heart of this passionate passionate visionary and you know he's absolutely determined to protect at all costs the great treasures in in the national library and um in the process of doing that he he helps out not only the british museum library but also a huge host of other institutions in london as well so so if it's if it's all a bit you know it, there's the little green book and there's the sort of tentative planning from 1933 when does it all really start to get a bit more formal it really starts to get to kick off after Munich um, because the Munich um, crisis actually became a sort of dress rehearsal. So they'd got these plans on paper very often. They triaged their collections into absolutely top stuff that we must get out of London, then slightly less important stuff, which can go a little bit later, and then perhaps things that we can keep on site or we're not so worried about. But with Munich, they had a chance to practice and that really showed up uh, some of the difficulties of transport, of timings, of logistics, of communications. Um, And most national museums and galleries had decided to send their collections off to the home counties, to uh, stately homes, often stately homes that were, or, or manor houses that were owned by their trustees or friends of friends of their trustees. Yeah. Um, although the Office of Works, the government department in charge of requisitioning property um, for war use, did have a list from, from around 1934 of potential properties that might be suitable. Um, but yeah, it was, only, it was only after Munich that, that that really started to firm up and they actually started to decide for certain which properties were going to be used and how. Uh, and was, uh, Caroline, was the plan to keep galleries open? during hostilities anyway that still be able to uh, accommodate visitors but they just won't be able to see some of the really good stuff i mean what it, or were they, what, what what how what was the plan for the museums as they existed or galleries as they existed anyway well the initial plan was that they would shut completely and everything would right. go right apart apart from i mean you know 
what what people often don't realize about museums and galleries is that you know there are levels of importance yes. in some of the items and yeah. and some things were thought to be suitable not exactly to be sacrificed but which if they went into the basement that was that was protection enough but then other things did you need to go into right. the london underground um <laughs> so, so, so so there's a there's there's a there's a com- there are committees arguing over this stuff to make these decisions then yeah that's right you know which <laughs> which <laughs> Which of our old masters need to leave and which need to stay, stay, <laughs> stay in the basement? But no, I think the pl- the plan was that everything would shut, and yeah, right. all of all of the collections would either be inaccessible or simply out of the capital. Actually, what happened because of the phony war was that people sort well, of sat yes, around exactly. then twiddling their fingers, thinking, "Oh, hold on, um, it's, it's it's not as bad as we thought it was." <laughs> so some museums and galleries did reopen bringing those lesser items back from the basement upstairs um, and of course famously the National Gallery although it had evacuated its its 2,000 paintings altogether did open up for those lunchtime concerts yes yeah. and um, and so on so uh, was there was Dame Myra the, Hess she was always playing that's it those. yes yes every lunchtime she or one of her mates uh, did a concert and you know they were tremendously popular uh, you, you, it, I think there was a very small charge, so so really anybody uh, could go. It wasn't just the elite who went. And uh, fantastic tales of people like Joyce Grenfell sort of making sandwiches in the canteen for these people who took them away in paper bags and, and ate them while they were watching the performances. You know, so so some institutions did carry on having a cultural role. But is there a, is there a sort of is there a formal sort of overseeing body that's uh, created? There is this uh, committee, the Museums and Galleries um, Commission, uh, that oversees it. Um, and um, but but really, actually, it's down to the dynamism or otherwise of the individual directors of the galleries and museums and, and archives. So some are more successful than others, depending on who's in charge. So. At the National Gallery, where you've got Kenneth Clark in charge, well, and, I was going to ask um, you about a- ably, <laughs> ably assisted by his uh, his brilliant um, uh, head conservator, a man called Ian Rawlins, um, decided to go his own way because that's Kenneth Clark. Um, yeah. And actually, Kenneth Clark, being so incredibly bullish and self confident, uh, made the right decision to send everything to Wales. In other places somewhere like the Imperial War Museum, rather ironically, uh, didn't do so well. Um, they had a, a slightly less effective director, I think it's fair to say. And also <laughs> because their museum trustees were largely made up of military men, they took a, well, a kind way of putting it might be that they took a more pragmatic view about um, about military damage and therefore felt that, you know, they should be a low priority. Other museums and galleries should be a higher priority. So the Imperial War Museum's own arrangements were, were less effective. Well, and the, um, and, the, 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 and the Imperial War Museum is brand new at this point anyway, isn't it? It's, not, it's only been going really for 20 years, hasn't it? it? Exactly. It's, it's, it, it's pretty new. Uh, it's not as professional, quite frankly, as the other, as the other institutions. And, but... But the Imperial War Museum ends up being one of the most badly damaged buildings yeah. during the Blitz. I mean, how long has the National Gallery been in existence at this point? The National Gallery has been going since the 19th century, since the mid 19th right. century. And Clark was appointed, I think, in 33 or 34. And right. he was a he was a very dynamic force and yeah, was yeah. a very determined popularist. So he'd, he'd really sort of... Um, brought it to public attention in a way that it never had been before. Gosh, this is, absolutely, this is so fascinating. I've never, never thought about any of this. Well, exactly. But there's, there's artwork, isn't there? But, but there's also other other treasures, you know. Whether it's... Well, yes, you mentioned the Doomsday Book in, yeah, in, in mean... your intro, Jim. So, so yes. for example, what happens with the Doomsday Book? Yeah, because also it's not, there's no point in sort of getting rid of the Doomsday Book and putting it in a tunnel in, in, in a mine shaft in Wales if it then goes mouldy. Correct. So... <laughs> <laughs> So there's quite a lot to think about, isn't it? It's there's an awful lot to think. Of, there's an awful lot to think about in terms of conservation. So you know, you can put your non-organic stuff into the London Underground. Um, so stonework, uh, jewels, non-corroding metals. You can stick all of that underground, and you know, providing it's not actually swimming with water, uh, the stuff will be okay. But you obviously can't do that with organic stuff like paper and parchment, um, fabrics, and so on. Doomsday Book is actually how I first came to write this book because oh, really? 
before I was at the Parliamentary Archives, I started my career at the Public Record Office today, the National Archives at Kew. Mm-hmm. But at that time, it was still in Chancery Lane. That's how that's how old I am. You know, back when dinosaurs <laughs> roamed the earth, this was when <laughs> Public Record <laughs> Office was at was at Chancery Lane. And um, while I was there, um, I remember as a as a young stripling archivist. Uh, being told the story of Doomsday Book and what happened during the Second World War, which was that it was evacuated on the, uh, I think, the 29th of August uh, down the Great West Road in an armed van, in a, in a sort of armed convoy uh, with uh, a guard riding shotgun uh, with the, beside the driver, along with some of the other top, absolutely top treasures from the Public Record Office. And it arrived in Somerset at Shepton Mallet Prison, the women's wing at Shepton Mallet's prison, which is where it it was going to be stored. But they'd made such good time down (laughs) on the journey down that they'd arrived half an hour early. So they all got out of the van and uh, went off to the local pub to have a pint of cider, (laughs) leaving it unlocked, which which rather... (laughs) which rather defeated the object of the exercise. So that story stayed with me. That story stayed with me for 25 years. And um, that really became the starting point for this book because I thought that was so funny. Unfortunately, when I when I actually did a bit more research, I discovered that it wasn't a pint of cider. It was actually, they went off to have a cup of tea, but it was still true that they right. left the van unlocked. I mean, g- given, <laughs> given the modern sort of white glove uh, culture in museums... <gasps> Don't talk to me about white gloves. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? This all sounds a bit. This all sounds, you know, or, or whatever, or you know, like because uh, uh, I, I saw where, where, gosh, where was it? We, where we, we looked at do um, uh, Magna Carta not so long ago. My wife and I, um, uh, and it was in, you know, in a darkened space and all that, and there's they can't let any light near it, and it's sort of vacuum packed or whatever. I mean, this is a different era in terms of, co- of conservation of documents and stuff, right? It is a different era. Just, just on the white glove point, can I just yes. say that white gloves are a beloved of film crews. They love white gloves. I know, yeah. I've but actually, so many white gloves, where you've had white gloves are absolutely rubbish for <laughs> consulting documents. They're very, you know, they're often very That's thick so cotton, thick yeah. cut cotton gloves make you really, really clumsy. Yeah, they're never washed between uses, so they're always incredibly grubby. Forget the white gloves; you just need nice, clean, dry hands. Right. That's all you well, need. Well, I'm all in favour of that. I mean, the amount of documentaries I've done where where we've gone, OK, here we go, white glove moment. No. Rolls yeah. eyes. no, no, no. P- TV producers love it, but um, I'm afraid actually white gloves are um, are, are a bit of a no-no. Out. A bit of a no-no. Okay. The only, they've, it's sort of moved, it's moved across from the auction house where bits of silver ah. are being displayed. And, yeah, you do need gloves when you're displaying metal work because you get well, things you all over them. Mm. Yeah. But, um, or, or indeed with certain kinds of negatives, pho- photographic negatives, that's that's fine. But you just need those classic nitrile glove things. That's that's all you need. Anyway, that's, sorry, that's my little, <laughs> that's my little bug there. Little might, would you cut, no, 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 you no, cut, no. You can cut that out. We are absolutely recording. not cutting. No, we are not anyway, cutting that, not, not for one moment. <laughs> back to Magna Carta and, yeah, and dark yeah, yeah. rooms and conservation. What's really interesting about this story from today's conservatives point of view is that there was this first wave of moves to the home counties and above yeah. ground in wales yeah and then after the fall of france when it became obvious that bombing of major cities in the north and the west was going to be possible particularly liverpool manchester cardiff and so on bristol yeah. um it suddenly became obvious that being above ground anywhere was going to be um a real no-no so there was there was another phase of activity to try and get all of this stuff underground and the two major places where they went underground was Manod Moor which is a mountain in Snowdonia which is where the National Gallery took its yeah. paintings and that's the famous story that people have, have perhaps heard about the other second phase move for places like the British Museum and the V&A uh, and some of the National Portrait Gallery was to the Corsham Tunnels uh, in the Mendips um, near mm. Avon Cliff, where the army had requisitioned uh, these underground spaces. But in fact, there was a small corner, uh, 25,000 square feet, wh- which was handed over for heritage storage. This stuff was underground. 
and it was kept in environmentally controlled conditions. They installed boilers, they installed dehumidifiers. Wow. Uh, wow. In Manod Moor, the National Gallery's reference library was set up there. They actually installed a conservation laboratory inside the mountain. Wow. And all of all of this space was monitored on a on an hourly basis and it provided if you like a sort of real life laboratory for actually testing conservation theories that had been being developed in the 1930s by this chap Ian Rawlins from the National Gallery mm. and his counterpart at the British Museum a, a scientist called Harold Plenderleith and they'd come up with some model conservation uh, standards for uh, heritage storage and now here is this brilliant opportunity to actually yeah. test them out properly. So, yeah. in fact, when you go into a darkened room and it's a little bit chilly in there today, if you go to an exhibition, they, that that environment is replicating the sort of storage environment that normally these items would be in if they weren't on display. And those storage standards are, if you like, the great grandchildren of the standards that were actually developed in those underground heritage stores in the Second World War. So we're My still sort of, we're still yeah. sort of living with that experience today. So it's called the 60-60 rule. It was called by Plenderleith and Rawlins, 60% humidity and 60 degrees Fahrenheit for My goodness. Um for for the that very crudely for for the sort of environment. Because we talk on this podcast a lot Caroline about how the Second World War is, is still around and you know that we live in its wake but i had no idea that that there's there's a, a direct an absolutely direct 100 percent direct example yeah Gosh. and and you know obviously war accelerates war, change war, war in, in innovation this, and, you know yeah, yeah. yeah this is this is a truism isn't it i mean this is yeah. this is how great leaps forward in technology are made and yeah. it's as yeah. true of it's of true of um home front technology as it is of of military technology so as well. so where did the elgin marbles for instance end up so you were uh, so about the uh, british museum yes so they went uh, into the aldwych tube tunnels uh, in right. the london underground um and there are some fantastic photographs of them being wheeled through the tunnels to safety i think initially they were initially they were shored up uh, sandbagged and and shored up actually in the museum itself because they're so enormously heavy like lots of the British Museum sculpture yeah uh, but then they were they were sent into the tunnels uh, in the disused Piccadilly line and Caroline what about the Sutton Hoo travels but uh, treasures because because they were only discovered in 1939 weren't they so but they were excavated nine days before war broke out yeah so they'd been in the earth for 1300 years and <laughs> they came up for a few days <laughs> and then they were buried again for another six years um, in the again in the Aldwych tube tunnels. They were they? Um, aided, the aided, yeah, and, and aided by the, um, the invention of something called the No Nails Box, which today oh. we would recognise as being a flat pack box, sort of from Ikea or somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, uh, that that was a new invention, and John Forsdyke, the director of the British Museum, ordered three thousand no nails boxes to be stored in the museum basements uh, from nineteen thirty eight, ready to go for when oh, they wanted from for when they needed to pack their smaller items, not the big sculpture, obviously, but you know small little bits of jewelry and the vases and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and no nails boxes were so incredibly easy to put together quickly. The manufacturer said that even a woman could do it. Oh, oh well, yeah. that, oh, well, and yet another breakthrough. Exactly, <laughs> as a result of Second World War innovation, <laughs> something else for women to do. How, how marvelous! <laughs> we need to take a break right now. We'll see you in a tick. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. You, you, you've mentioned um, William Llewellyn Davis, and, and we've sort of touched on Kenneth Clark, but who, who are all these people that are d doing all this? I mean, you know, I, I don't know much about Kenneth Clark, but he's, he was Kenneth Clark's father, wasn't he? He was Alan he, Clark's dad, He was Alan yes. Clark's father, yeah. Who are they? Well, um, I, I've just, I've, I've mentioned um, uh, Kenneth Clark. Um, he's the actual director, but, but most of the work was done by uh, the curators, uh, who were in charge of uh, the collections themselves and by the conservation scientists who were advising 
the museums you know and these are people who normally um well i think <laughs> i describe them <laughs> i describe this as a as a coalition of mild-mannered civil servants social oddballs and metropolitan aesthetes so these are not people <laughs> these are not people who are normally in the public eye uh, yeah. and they certainly had a range of eccentricities i think it's fair to say well lady helena glycan sounds interesting oh Oh, she's great. Yes. Now she's she's one of the custodians. So she's not she's not employed by uh, the uh, the Tate Gallery, but she ends up being the the person who owns the destination of one of the uh, one of the collections. Um, yes. Yeah, so Helena Glycan is the half great niece of Queen Victoria. So she's a distant royal <laughs> um, on the German side of the family. But during mm. the sec during the First World War, the family renounces its German titles and. Uh, takes takes on um, uh, takes on lesser sort of English titles, uh, and during the First World War, she had run an X-ray unit on the Italian front with her female lover. Um, uh, she was a lesbian, and um, she she sort of ran away to war with with a married woman called uh, Nina Hollins. The both of them, um, you know, well into middle age by this time, sort of fifties, early sixties, um, and they. They did this during the First World War, got loads of medals, just amazing, an amazing pair. And then 20 years later, they're sort of called upon to house the Tate collections in their manor house in Herefordshire called Helen's Manor, appropriate enough. Um, and uh, yes, <laughs> Helena Glycan <laughs> does not take very well to the, the, Tate, the Tate workmen, the warders who are normally patrolling the gallery rooms and doing the security who are sent down with these paintings so they you know they get drunk they sort of pick fights in the local pubs they refuse right. to help with the harvest um they give lots and she of she takes a dim view of all of this she take well she takes a dim view well she doesn't really want men in the house to start off with yeah uh, but having having to have men in the house uh, to look after the paintings or make sure that they're okay she is unimpressed by their behavior <laughs> um and you know she's not to be messed with really her her favorite her favorite meal is smoked salmon caviar gentleman's relish all washed down with a bottle of champagne mm. um and when when the fall of france came she marched into the local regimental headquarters and demanded 80 guns for her much markle watchers which is uh, what what she called her her private home guard that she was drilling on the estate. She was refused the guns, and she she ended up having to drill drill them with with her, you know, the sort of ancient sort of um, hal halberds and sort of you know um, weapons that were on the wall of wall of the manor. Um, she she once she once shot a she once shot a charging bull with a single shot. So yeah, she, you don't mess with Lady Helena Glycan, that's for sure. Amazing. Um, uh, but actually, she sounds like so, something out of an Evelyn War novel, doesn't she? I know. Yeah, well, I, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Actually, it's funny you should mention that because Evelyn War in Men at Arms at the start at Men at Arms does describe a scene where the owners of a country house think that they're going to they they've got this great wheeze that instead of having an evacuated boarding school or squaddies practicing in the landscape park, they volunteered to take on. Uh, national art and they think they're going to get constables and turners to add yeah. to their collections um, and that doesn't happen they end up with these giant crates of <laughs> Assyrian sculpture from the British Museum that push them out <laughs> of their main living rooms and <laughs> they have to they have to live in the servants quarters so that that is pretty much what happened to quite a lot of these um, these owners who'd who'd volunteered their their houses for uh, for national national treasures storage, but uh, yeah, um, peace broke out at Helen's after Helena Glycan's nephew, who had been badly wounded, um, and I can't remember whether it was at Dunkirk or whether it was in the Norway campaign. Um, he was convalescing at her house, and then two of these Tate warders who were behaving badly suddenly had a sort of turnaround and sort of took to valeting this very badly injured nephew and. Uh, that went down a bit better. So, yeah, things improved from there on, I think. But which stage in the war was the sort of process of exodus of the artwork complete? I mean, because it, it, it couldn't all be done in a month, could it, all this? Well, it was la it was largely done. It was largely done uh, between the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the, the, the announcement of war. It was, really? The, ma the major evacuation took Goodness. place over the course of roughly... 
a week, 10 days. Goodness me. Um, th- th- there certainly were subsequent waves of um, evacuation, you know, for lesser yeah. imp- it, uh, items of lesser importance. And, yeah. for example, the paintings were often taken out of their frames yeah. and sent without frames uh, to their destinations. The frames travelled on later. And, you know, for some really heavy, important collections, like those sculpture collections going into the Aldwych Tube, you know, there was a constant, uh, you know, a constant stream of things going yeah. in, you know, really up to 1942. But uh, really, the vast majority was of, all the done most, straight of the most away. precious things was done in, in, the, in the first month or so. Gosh, how amazing. And amazing? then, incredible. And then how many of the galleries were, were then damaged in the bombing? So, well, so, nearly, nearly all of them, nearly all right. of them had sustained some damage, but the worst affected were the Imperial War Museum, like I've yeah. said. Um, the Tate was very, very badly damaged. The whole wing of the Tate uh, was just devastated. And there's a fantastic description in the autobiography of John Rothenstein, who was the director of the Tate, who actually... Uh, slept in the basement of the building, which today is Tate Britain, of course. Yeah. Uh, describing coming coming up in the middle of a bombing raid, actually to see the damage, not not an entirely wise thing to do. No. Um, and and seeing just huge shards of glass, taller than himself, buried in the in the lawn outside. Wow. Um, and um, so the tape's badly damaged. And if you walk down the side of Tate Britain today, you can still see the, the pop marks from the, from the bombing. And, and the Victoria and Albert was very badly damaged as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, similarly, they have a pockmarked wall down the side of the building, which they've turned into their war memorial. They've carved yeah. the inscription of the war memorial itself around the, uh, the holes in the wall. Yeah. So, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and I'm assuming in all this that you know the Diplodocus from the, from the Natural History Museum. Where does that end up? <laughs> oh, now you're asking. Now yes. Let me let what me, did, let me did, remember all those what happens to him. Right. Okay. So, what happens to him, as far as I can recall, is that he's dismantled and he goes into the basement at the right. Natural History Museum. Um, uh, so, the problem with the Natural History Museum is that a lot of these exhibits are very the specimens are very fragile. Yeah, 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 yeah. Things like butterfly, trays of butterflies and all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, they get they get evacuated to various country houses. Some of them, you know, that are in glass jars and so on, they yeah. end up being they end up being destroyed and one of the mammal galleries ends up full of full of stuffed <laughs> stuffed lions and things ends <laughs> up ends up being destroyed. Um a, a wing of the National History Museum Natural, sorry, Natural History Museum Natural becomes is also here. It, yeah, yeah, but it becomes. Um, does it not become a, an experimentation laboratory as well for the SOE? This is where they invented the exploding rat <laughs> in the, oh, in the, yes. the, natu- in the Natural that. History Museum. In the yes, Natural History right, Museum, yeah. appropriately right. enough, that is where the the SOE's exploding <laughs> rat was invented. Oh, gosh, <laughs> this is incredible! What a story! And and when the when the war ends, there's then a, a process of bringing well. Obviously, the buildings need to be repaired before you can bring the collections back. So that's a much slower process after uh, after the war of, of of restoring the collections and restoring the buildings and 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 and. So does that begin on May the eighth, or w- when does the committee meet to, or the pamphlet <laughs> get published to make that happen? Yeah. So the individual museums and galleries make their own arrangements, and it it really it really starts from VE Day. Yeah, so things start to come back to London quite swiftly in some cases. Uh, but for some collections, uh, it takes a bit longer. So the British Museum's collections deep in the underground stayed there um, into the, 19, the late 1940s. And some of the buildings themselves weren't fully restored again until the 1960s. Um, you know, whole wow. whole galleries have been devastated. So in some cases, the... Uh, the items went back to the the unaffected portions of the buildings but but really there was a a generation long reconstruction of some mm. of these spaces and for some of the uh, certainly for the office of works and for some of these institutions of course um by the late 1940s there was concern about nuclear war and the soviet union so 
you know, there was then a sort of a new phase of planning about what are we going to do uh, in the case of nuclear war. So, you know, if you look at if you look at the Office of Works files at the National Archives, there's then another set of thinking about, well, what is possible if 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 the button is pressed? Well, not, not a lot. It's the not a lot. Surely. Exactly. It's the conclusion, surely. Exactly. Yeah. Not a lot. It, it couldn't be the same sort of evacuation that happened in 1939 goodness and is anything lost in this process um do they not, mislay anything no i've not come across anything that was lost um i i've sort of plowed through lots and lots of um note notebooks the curators were absolutely meticulous in keeping yeah. lists in in little exercise books of all of the individual items you know full of colored pencil ticks and crosses against them showing things that were moved where they went and, you know, just them being taken in and out of the store to air mm. them and so on. Nothing was lost. Um, very few things were damaged. Um, yeah. uh, and I think a few things that were um, were at the National Library of Wales um, <laughs> slipped behind a radiator or something and got temporarily mislaid, but um, they, they made their way back to London uh, pretty swiftly. So all in all, it was it was a really extraordinary operation just just in terms of the logistics of keeping track of all of this stuff and all wrapped up around some truly extraordinary and eccentric people i mean i do sort of slightly feel we're, we don't have quite as many eccentrics in this country as we used to was that just me? oh i don't know I, th I think you know you, think there are plenty <laughs> you ch still. check out check out a few museum and art gallery <laughs> and archive curators and i think you'll find you'll find <laughs> you'll find a number i mean what's striking about this caroline is um because uh, uh, we've talked about this again we've touched on this on the podcast is the sheer contrast between this and what the the german government um or the nazi regime is up to art wise the sheer absolute you know we've because we, we've talked about goering running around holland or sending his agents out to buy him pictures at you know at, criti at critical moments in the battle of britain he's he's more concerned with getting his hands on art than he is with running the battle efficiently. The, contra the contrast is quite extraordinary. It's really interesting to think about what, what the actual risk was, what the jeopardy was in relation to these national collections, because obviously bombing is just one. Yeah. You're talking about Goering's bloated collection of Western masterpieces. Well, you know, had invasion occurred, then clearly some things would have been siphoned off and sent back. Um, yeah. to 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 be on the walls of uh, his his collection, or you know, at the at the Führer Museum or whatever. Um, some things would no doubt have been looted. Some dege so called degenerate art would have been destroyed or yeah. or flogged flogged on the market in Zurich or whatever. Well, wow, because that's exactly what the Nazis did. They had these. They had these. Well, that's right. Assigned exactly. art dealers who were to steal degenerate art and then sell it. That's right. And exactly. what, what they were doing, though, is they were they were ripping off people because they were ripping off the people they were nicking it from, and then they were ripping off the Nazi regime because they were only inventorising. You know, say they've taken Some nineteen yeah. paintings, they'd only list to Berlin fifteen, and they'd half inch the other four of themselves. Which is why yeah. you have that extraordinary episode of that chap in the the son of one of the one of the um, degenerate art dealers having that flat in munich full of well and also they're they're lying to the german public aren't they because they're saying this art's degenerate and it's no good and they're making money out of it so it's like it's it's well, the... <laughs> only degenerate people would buy degenerate art i suppose is, is, i suppose is, is the i idea. suppose but i they're... suppose but they're not they're not they're not being honest to destroy it you know like uh, you, you know so, what i mean so so i think for, for i think for curators in in london viewing what was happening in the art capitals of Europe during the second half of the 1930s, this was this was becoming, you know, really serious. This 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 is a taste of what might happen. And then there's a final, what I think is a really interesting aspect of the peril that these collections might have been exposed to had invasion occurred, mm. um, which is, in my view, probably just as bad as total destruction. Or, or theft, and that is something along the lines of what happened to the Bayer Tapestry in Normandy when it um, piqued the interest of Himmler and his henchmen. And it was 
it was seized by the Nazis and then subjected to scientific experimentation. As you may know that the biotapestry is not actually a tapestry, it's an embroidery yes. on a fabric backing. And um, it was unstitched, um, so very intrusive. And the interior was examined, x-rayed um, and photographed and experimented on and then sewn up again and reclassified <laughs> as a Germanic um, cultural artefact created by the Vikings and used, if you like, to prop up that sort of pro-Aryan propaganda. And so you can see what might perhaps have happened with the Doomsday Book or what might have happened with the Sutton Hoo treasure in those circumstances. And I think yes, that's, that's, that's really, I think that's really quite sinister. And when you combine that with uh, knowing that um, the... Uh, the, the information hefts GB, um, the, the, the Gestapo black book, um, uh, sort of manual of, of um, listing, listing all of the, the museums and galleries in the UK that are worth knowing about, reading between the lines of that as well. Um, there's a sense that, you know, these places are being lined up for, for looting and their collections are being targeted or would be targeted specifically for some some alternative future existence yeah i, th I find that really chilling Goodness wow me. what a fascinating story in in the event of an invasion what what then would happen would you would you roll a boulder over the <laughs> over the you know, you know what i mean or, an extra or, special or, padlock <laughs> how you how you then stop that from happening um, uh, I suppose is was in is in the bounds of what if did they discuss that did they discuss what to do in the event of invasion. Well, it, interestingly, one of the um, one of the British Museum curators, based in Northamptonshire at a stately home called Drayton House, um, was told that um, if if invasion did occur, then um, he was to find the, the you know the the most senior German officer locally and explain that the British Museum's collection was here and that therefore, you know, their protection was required. That that's one that's one possible solution. I'm sure that would work. But for but for other for <laughs> other places, you know, Lady Helena at Helen's I'm sure would have been out there with her shotgun. Yeah. Um yeah, and, and a halberds. Yeah. And yes, exactly. <laughs> and for the underground storage um in the Mendips and in Snowdonia, it was very remote. It would have been very difficult to find um, to find them and unless someone locally had um, blabbed about it then yeah. nobody would really have known it was there unless they'd managed to get hold of any of the records from 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 the office of works or correspondence and so on that would have been identified where this was but, the, but they'd have had the shredder out in the event eventuality yeah, of, a, they'd have of, been, of an invasion they'd have they? been burning it all and quite yeah. obviously quite a lot of government departments anyway were had been evacuated themselves to wales and, yeah. and yes. other places so some of those records would not even have been in London. Of course, it wouldn't be like that today. <laughs> People no. on social media, as soon as you saw a van, you know, leaving, leaving. Uh, be videos know, of it national, and everything. The National Portrait Gallery, you'd be snapping away, and it would yeah. be all over. Yeah. Hashtag yeah. treasures evacuation or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> it it, it would be impossible funny. today. But you know, there were there were odd there were odd stories in local papers that seems to have sort of got into local papers. But sort of dark van journal, saying for people seeing in the middle of the night and things. Yeah, even journalists were very you know they themselves were very subtle about it. And I and I guess there were so many troop movements and disruption to train services and strange things happening on the roads in that that yeah. final week of um august 1939 that you know these things would probably not have been they would have gone gone without being noticed i think oh well it's been fascinating thank you caroline thank you so much caroline this is so interesting well, yeah it really thank is. you both very much national treasures saving the nation's art in world war Two is uh the name of caroline's book and i, I um I, I, I'll, I bought it on Kindle while we were talking. I thought, I well thought, done. I've got, <laughs> and, I, and I ordered my mum a copy because it's completely up. It's 100% her thing. This is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you all soon. Cheerio. Cheerio.